a parrot of privilege. I strode up the curving driveway and under the soaring arch through which caparisoned elephants would once have plodded. The lines of the old Haveli made my heart sing with delight to have this fantastic opportunity to restore it. I entered with soft feet, as we say, signifying respect. Baiji had an air of quiet dignity that inspired unquestioning respect. She wore crisp white kota saris or French chiffons in muted colours, draped over her head and wispy plait and tucked decorously across her chest and under the opposite arm. A double string of perfectly graduated basra pearls hung unassumingly around her neck. The Haveli was chock full of priceless jewels like that. Antique European furniture, Venetian mirrors, marble tables, Chinese jars, Japanese screens painted with infinite subtlety, Chandeliers that made you gasp. Exquisite Indian fabric with mirror work and real gold zari embroidery. Intricate silver objects strewn everywhere in daily use. I offered Baiji a respectful kamagani, which she accepted with her customary brisk smile. Mekchand was beside me as I sat, bearing chilled kesar sharbat and spicy bhujia in thin, gold-flecked glassware on a silver tray. Baiji's personal attendant, Manu Devi, sat immobile in the shadows, in her red and orange ghagra, with her yellow orni halfway down her face. On Baiji's left shoulder, in his established position, sat her pet parrot, Khattu. Every so often, Baiji reached into a covered bowl and withdrew a tidbit for him. A spicy chilli, a seed or a berry... He was evidently a parrot of some privilege. Baiji couldn't wander the winding staircases and narrow corridors of the Haveli, so I brought her photos and videos on my iPad. She was fascinated by how I was carving out ensuite bathrooms and providing mod cons like air conditioning and heating without diluting the traditional flavor. Everything was being restored, repaired, painted, or polished. Baiji sent me Ratan Lal, a master in mosaic mirror work, and Rukmini Bai and her daughters-in-law to expertly darn the tapestries. Chanchal Bai to stitch new overhead pulley pankhas with brilliant red, blue, green and yellow applique work and Bhanwar Lal for the stained glass. It seemed a never-ending list of projects to dovetail. But sadly, for me, the end was looming. Not yet close, but within sight. So I made bold to push my boundaries. Baiji, may I ask a personal question? She smiled indulgently, so I forged on. I feel certain there is a story to your parrot. He is cut too, so there must surely have been a mid too. Would you be willing to tell me? She became still and pensive and I feared I'd gone too deep into the water and made some waffling sounds indicating she needn't answer. But in the presence of her stillness, I too became still and silent. My husband was from a royal family, and I was just a girl in this town. There was no way he would have noticed me or any of the other girls here, though we all gushed and blushed over Kuarsa. Every day, he and his horse galloped through our streets and past our playgrounds. And behind him fluttered his two parrots, this Khattu and his partner, as you guessed, Mittu. When the horse stopped, these two landed delicately on his shoulders, one either side. Horse, man and birds, they were a single flamboyant unit. The royal family has always been integrated in village life. At Holi, Diwali and Tij, 
we all celebrate together. But there has always been a respectful distance, you understand. The family instituted the schools here and even today attend on special occasions. As my husband grew from boy to young man, some of these social duties devolved to him. In my last year of school, I won every prize in my class. I can tell you I almost died of excitement on prize day when I saw him entering our school and realized I'd be getting my prize from his hands. I was just 16, you know. She smiled, but not at me, for she was wandering the romantic avenues of her girlhood. They always start with the junior classes because the babies get impatient. So for half an hour, we older girls sat and gazed adoringly at him. I saw his eyebrows shoot up at the long list of subjects I was being awarded for. I didn't hear the clapping, I didn't notice my proud parents or my smiling teachers or anything. I could see only him, dressed so smartly in full white with a bright pink safa on his head. He pretended to stagger under the weight of my prize books and I remember giggling madly. As I covered the last few steps, this khattu flew off his shoulder and perched on mine. I saw the shock in his eyes. Those birds never ever went to anyone else. I must have collected my books. I must have returned to my seat. I don't recall any of it. The parrot on my shoulder was the only thing I could think of. I would have to go back to Kuwarsa and surrender the bird. I hadn't done anything wrong, but I felt terribly guilty. This bird ruffled its feathers at its master, but wouldn't budge. I plucked it off my shoulder and reached out to hand it over. But neither master nor bird moved a muscle. I have relived those moments so many times, for they changed my whole future. Suddenly, this naughty khattu flew out of my hands and back to his master. The school hall resounded with claps and he thanked me sincerely. But I felt I had brought him disgrace and was embarrassed. The prizes I'd worked so hard to earn brought no joy. I'd always been a good student, but that prize day was traumatic. The very next day, my parents were informed that Maranisa wished to visit us. And when would it be convenient? I wailed that I hadn't done anything to call the bird. My mother scolded me. She had so much to do to get ready to receive Maranisa. And here I was wringing my hands over yesterday. My father sent a reply that Maranisa was always welcome and should come whenever she pleased. She said she would come at four. At two, we were dressed in our best clothes and waiting. My mother had made some frothy chas and freshly roasted and powdered the cumin seeds to season it. She floated the brass pot inside an earthen vessel of water to keep it cool. A plate of matris was kept ready and another of barfi. Maranisa didn't usually visit people at home. It was too imposing a burden for us. Just at four, we saw her coming towards our home and all three of us were alert. She came with four or five other women, but at our doorstep, she entered alone. She greeted my mother warmly and folded her hands in greeting to my father. She summoned me as she sat and I crept to her in sheer terror. Tears spilled nervously from my eyes. I begged her to forgive me. I never called the parrot and I didn't know why it came to me. I had not meant to insult Kuwarsa. Astoundingly, she laughed and lifted my chin to look into my face. But he did come to you, she said. Khattu saw something in you. And my son, he trusts his birds. He says he will marry only you. 
So I have come to request your parents to give us their beautiful and clever daughter to brighten our ancient Haveli. The three of us were struck completely dumb. We could not even have dreamed of such an outcome. I don't remember if we ever offered her our chas, but I clearly remember her opening a silk drawstring bag and taking out two thick gold kadas. She said, till we made our decision, she wanted me to have these for being the first young lady to capture her son's heart. Baiji held out her frail wrist to me, weighed down by a splendid pair of matched kadas. From the moment I entered this haveli as a bride, this khattu sped to my shoulder and here he has stayed all these years. He is the matchmaker who forged my marriage and he's a wise bird for my husband and I had many wonderful decades together. After he left us, his mittu refused to be consoled and sank away and followed him within days. But Khattu stayed and kept me company in my widowhood. And one day, we will fly away to our next life together and all four of us will be joyfully reunited. Her hands reached for the covered bowl and she sought a special treat for her dear friend and constant companion. I sat quietly joked with her ancient memories to speak. The little trills and squawks from the wise old bird as he enjoyed his treat were the only sounds in the soft nostalgia of the room. 